Did you like that? Perhaps it, it resonated with you and maybe you just thought that is, that's, that's not how it's sung. But maybe if you think for a minute about where the story of God is going as we celebrate Advent, uh, maybe those are the exact words we need to be saying. And if you've ever had a relationship or a friendship where you long for the day that there would be restoration and reconciliation, you know that the need for forgiveness usually is part of that equation. And Oftentimes it's hard for us in our pride to admit that we need to be forgiven. And sometimes the absence of that person in your life is, well, it, is, it, is, it, it creates such a, a longing that you're willing to even do that. Now maybe you're there, maybe you're not. But as we go into this week of Advent together, it centers on an experience that people weren't having that they had come to expect for so long and now it was gone and had been gone for quite a while that uh, they had a longing for well that experience to happen once again. Now if you're like me you come to Advent as a person of non-Jewish descent and you recognize that there's so much about the Bible and the experience of God's people as it centers in the life of Jesus that is grounded in his story and connection to a person named Abraham who was God's means by which he created his own family and his own purposes uh, were being fulfilled through their lives and he was present in their lives unlike any other people. And being of non-Jewish descent, I had a, a, a sense that when I started reading the Bible that I couldn't fully understand what was going on without some help. And as you read through the New Testament and you find so many things have to do with things that have happened before, you start digging into the backstory and then you begin to capture the significance of why things are the way they are. Now, when we look at the life that we are called to live here on earth, on this side of the cross in the empty tomb, I think it's hard for us to appreciate all the things that were going on in the lives of the people when Jesus entered the world. What their hopes and fears were, what their concerns were, what it was that uh, was pressing in on them. And if you're like me, perhaps you think that as you hear the news and you see the uncertainty and you wonder sometimes about the purpose of it all or even how things are going to turn out, you find yourself wondering, what difference does Jesus make? And I think we can answer that question best when we recapture what he meant whenever he first appeared. Now as we go through this time of Advent together, it's a way of wrapping our minds around something that uh, maybe we've overlooked. And that is, how is it that we live in the wake of the blessing of everything that Jesus has done without really knowing what that blessing means? Now, our story today centers on something called the temple. That's where it kind of begins. And if you are a person who is of Jewish descent, the temple meant a lot. But if you're a person like me, we don't have any temples. We have a church that kind of looks like a temple, but we don't really get the full sense of the significance of why you have a building like this. However, if you are a Jewish person, you look back to the beginning of the story and you see something that isn't fully happening right now that you want to recapture. And that is that sense that God is with us. God is dwelling in our midst. And if you look at the very first chapter of, 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 of the book of Genesis, you find God saying, I am with you. I'm with you in the garden. I'm with you in Eden. And I want to dwell with you. And I want to create a space where heaven and earth come together. And I want you to be there with me forever. But the problem was... Not everybody was on board. And if you have people who aren't on board with something, they tend to kind of go in different directions. And there was a parting of the ways and it disrupted everything to the point where God completely removed himself from the picture. And then God said, I want to reinsert myself back in. And I want to make things happen. And there's this image of the temple that he utilizes 
to begin to restore that connection that you have between God and ourselves. Now, if you're like me, you come into a place like this wondering sometimes, God, are you really there? Are you really close by? Are you hearing my prayers? Are you seeing what I'm going through? Are you seeing what they're going through? And you get a sense that you're not quite sure that God is close by. However, if you pay careful attention to the scripture, you find that, in fact, he's closer than you think. So before I go any farther in this introduction, I want to I just ask God uh, to speak through me and, and through his word to us so that we can, we can begin to hear him and see him as, uh, as he, by design, has, has uh, enabled us. Father, as we just take this moment and we surrender it to you, we are grateful that we have one who is our great high priest, who is by your side hearing our prayers and enabling us, Father, to move through life with an awareness that you are with us, that God is with us, that Emmanuel is part of the equation, that our Lord Jesus is the one who came and embodied everything that you were and showed us the way. And as you, Lord Jesus, live in us, you remind us in subtle and dramatic ways that you're faithful and that you'll be present. So be with, present with us now, Lord, as we go into your word. And I say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, did you guys uh, uh, go and visit family during uh, Thanksgiving? And, and if you did, did you find that the space that you went into was different than your own house? At least that's what I experienced. Uh, at our house, we don't have television very much. It's down in the basement. We don't really watch it that often. But I discovered that whenever I was at a one relative's house, that they not only have one television, they've got, I'm, I'm guessing, upwards of 10. Well, at least I counted four, and I didn't go into all the rooms, but whether it was in the great room, the kitchen, the living room, uh, out in the RV, in the garage, there's a TV. And it's just blaring all the time. And if you're like me and you have a little bit of ADHD, you're thinking, that's just a little too much because every time I move to a different room, I'm hearing a different, uh, a different story uh, being, being, being broadcast out to me. And uh, it just seems like a cacophonous display of chaos. And it was a little overwhelming. And honestly, I... I, I wouldn't, I, it wouldn't hurt me, hurt my feelings any at all if my television at home never turned back on again. But then I asked the question, why is it that people need to have the TV going on in their lives all the time? Now for older people, I get it. It is a place, it is, it is, it is something that, that, that enables you to feel like I'm not alone. But for other people, I can't help but wonder if it's a way of being distracted from our own thoughts. You ever turn on the TV or listen to something online or a podcast or the radio? Because the fact of the matter is, you don't want to hear the noise that's going on inside your head. I'll be honest with you, I've done exactly that. But just imagine if you were alive 2,100 years ago and you didn't have television, and you didn't have those forms of distraction, the only thing that you had was the silence of your own thoughts. That's all you had. And imagine if you were living in a time when the world that you inhabited had seen better days, had seen a time when God was richly a part of it in the temple, and now you're living in a time when he's gone. And all you have is silence. And all you have to think about are the problems that are going on out there. Unless you're rooted and grounded in a story that preoccupies your mind in such a way that you are constantly referencing it as you're thinking about what's going on out there. Now if you can put yourself in that place where you're disconnected from all forms of media and all that you have is your thoughts and the option of thinking about the bad in the world or the possible hopes that you have in your story, 
a lot of people in that period of silence were saying, I need to pay attention to that story because it's really all I got. Now the scripture that we're reading centers on a couple of people who are living in that moment. And they happen to be involved in the temple during the time of the birth of Jesus. And in their imagination every day they had the story that they would play constantly that rooted them in their identity and it provided for them a sense of where history is going and what God is doing and what it's all about. And if you're like me, if you're of non-Jewish descent, that just doesn't come naturally or easy or automatically. It's something that we have to tune into. So I want to take just a couple of minutes and I want to show you just in brief what the imagination of the guy that we're getting ready to talk about, what his mind was pondering as he thought about his story and the problems that the people around him were facing. So let's take a look. If you could go back to the city of Jerusalem during Bible times, the biggest thing you'd see is the temple. This beautiful building was designed by King David and built by King Solomon, and they believed that it was the home of the God of the universe. Wait, I thought God's home was in heaven. Well, the whole point of this earthly temple is that it's the place that overlaps with God's heavenly home. The temple is where God lives and rules all creation as king. That's cool, but... Even Solomon, who built the temple, didn't believe that it could contain the God of the universe, right? Yeah, the building was just a symbol. And it pointed to the fact that all of creation is God's temple. And that's actually what the first page of the Bible, Genesis 1, is all about. Really? It says that creation is God's temple? Well, it doesn't need to say it. The whole story shows it. In Genesis 1, God creates an ordered world out of a dark wasteland by speaking in a series of seven days. Then on the seventh day, God's presence fills creation as he takes up his rest and rule. Similarly, the tabernacle and later the temple were built and dedicated in a series of seven speeches and seven days, after which the priest or king could rest and rule in God's presence. Ah, so all of creation is where God intends to dwell. It's like his temple. Exactly. Now, turn the page to Genesis 2 and we get another portrait of creation. This one focuses in on the land. And in the center of the land is a region called Eden, which in Hebrew means delight. And in the middle of delight, God plants a garden in which God and humanity live together. And that's why the temple was modeled after the garden, filled with imagery of gold and flowers. The menorah symbolized the tree of life. It's the place where God dwells with his people. Oh, got it. And check this out. In the temple, the Israelite priests and Levites were to work and to keep the temple in God's presence. This is exactly the job description given to humanity in the Garden of Eden. So these humans were the first priests. But instead of ruling with God, they wanted to rule on their own terms, and they're exiled from the Garden Temple. And like Adam and Eve, Israel's leaders also wanted to rule on their own terms, and they too were exiled. The temple was destroyed, and this left them wondering, did God give up on Israel? Will God bring about a new creation? Well, the biblical prophets anticipated the day when God would create a new temple with a new priesthood. That's when God's presence would fill all of creation. And when the Israelites returned to the land, they did rebuild the temple. But that temple didn't turn out the way the prophets hoped. In fact, later Israelite prophets said that this temple was hopelessly corrupt. So they're still waiting for the ultimate temple. And here we come to the story of Jesus. He said that through him, God's presence and rule was coming into our world in a new way. And he presented himself as a new kind of priest. But Jesus wasn't a priest, and he didn't work in the temple. Right. Jesus said that God's presence, his rest and rule, was filling the world through his own life, death, and resurrection. Jesus was claiming that he was the true temple, and this new temple would expand out to include all of creation. 
That's a really big claim. And it got even bigger. After his resurrection, Jesus said that God's presence would come to dwell in and among his followers so that they would become mini temples. Communities of people where God rests and rules. Exactly. This is the Bible's vision of the church, which is described as a temple. Not a building, but people. Yeah, like when Peter says, you all are living stones built up as a temple for God's spirit to dwell. So, at the end of the story, do we ever get a new physical temple? Well, not exactly. What we see is a renewed cosmic temple, just like Genesis 1. And this new creation doesn't need a temple building because through Jesus, all creation is now the place where God rests and rules the world with his people. So everybody got that? There's going to be a test at the end of the sermon. So get your pens and pencils ready. And it'll, only, it'll be brief. It's a pass-fail test. If you fail it, we got to do all this all over again. Uh, if not, then hopefully you're kind of catching on to what was going on in the mind of the people that we're getting ready to talk about. You see, I, I grew up on lots of television programs. And that really defined the experiences or the range of experiences that I had when it came to storytelling and stories that were interesting. But I couldn't honestly say that I was connected to a story per se that defined me. Maybe as an adult, uh, I binge watched uh, a couple of programs not to have a story that would define me, but rather stories that would distract me from the things that I have to face in the everyday. But as we read the Bible, we find that God doesn't want us to be in that place where we're constantly looking for distractions to keep us away from the painful moments and the painful realities of life. But rather, God wants us to be rooted in a story that we use to face our suffering head on with. And in the process, it enables us to draw him into that experience and transform it. Now, if you can imagine putting yourself in the, in the shoes of a couple of people who worked at the temple, who were relatives of Jesus' parents, and who were living day in and day out in a sense of hopelessness, in an environment where everything that they did was designed to create hope in the lives of people around them. They were essentially descendants and workers from families that took care of the temple. And the people that I'm talking about are found in the, the opening chapter of the book of Luke. And he describes two individuals. One of them is Zachariah. And there's his much younger bride who has been unable to have a child, Elizabeth. Interestingly enough, by the way, Diane. Uh, so that was very timely, by the way. Um, and as uh, they are day in and day out observing the temple worship and attending to those things and living uh, the, the, the re-dramatization of all the rituals that they do every year that are designed to remind them of who they were as the people of God. They also knew that in the storyline there was a time when God was with them. But now when they go to the temple it doesn't seem like God is very close, close at hand. Matter of fact, you get the impression that they haven't heard from God in an extremely long time. And by extreme, I mean 400 years. And you may be asking, what's the problem? They had the temple. They had the word of God. But for whatever reason, the person of God left. And four, five, six hundred years before, it was dramatic. It was a reversal of things that had happened generations before where the temple is built and you see this, this cloud of God's glory coming in and filling the Holy of Holies with his presence. And everybody was ecstatic because the, the old idea of God being with us has now begun to be recaptured. And it was pretty awesome. But like anything, after a while, you get sort of bored with the state of affairs and you start looking around for distractions and maybe you try to find ways to, well, to entertain yourself or perhaps you start looking at that God there and saying, he's not doing what I want him to do. And essentially, over time, 
people sort of lost touch with that God who was in their midst. Have you ever had the, the, the experience of having something, taking it for granted, and then once it's gone, you're like, oh wow, I never knew what I had until it was gone. And there's a sense that the people were experiencing that generation after generation after generation to the point where Zachariah and his wife have also inherited a hope but no presence even though they had the temple. You see, generations prior, just as dramatically as the Spirit of God in all of his glory descended upon the temple, it left and they saw it leave. And if you've ever had people over to your house that were non-dramatic, that were pleasant if not enjoyable, and made you feeling good about life and about yourself, and then they leave? How do you feel? It's, it's probably the loneliest part of the departure is when they go. When we descend on my daughter Mayam's house, uh, she says, you know, it's the hardest when you guys go, like that first hour. It feels so lonely. And I said, yeah, I kind of get it. I remember having that experience on, in, uh, in, my own, in my own life and how it is that you really miss that thing, that it factor that you took for granted while it was there. Well, they had that it factor on, on, you know, on mega steroids. And yet, as they were experiencing that, they took it for granted and they really didn't know what they had until it was gone. Now for 400 years, they're not hearing much, if anything. And then God says, it's time. It's time to show up, and it's time to make myself known, and it's time to make this real again. And so he shows up to two people, two people that had aged long enough that they were unable to bear children. You ever hear of any Old Testament people that were like that? Namely, the, 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 names, the, the, the progenitor of the whole thing, Abraham and his wife, Sarah. And God says, we're going to do this again. And I'm going to show you without any, with any possible doubt that I'm, I, I'm involved in this process. And I'm going to start by giving you a child when you knew, against, hoping against hope, that that possibility died a long time ago. And so Elizabeth gets word. She's going to have a child. But she doesn't really discover that until her husband goes through this experience that is really kind of unusual and, and fortuitous. He had, as a priest, won the lottery of a thousand people. He was the chosen one who on that day would be responsible for attending the inner sanctum of the temple. It was a great privilege and so he goes, and this temple is the space that God never inhabited. It was just an empty built building, and you could feel it, even though it had all of the features that were represented in what you saw in that, in that, in that, in that depiction. There was no life. And yet, on this day, when he walks in, who does he meet but an angel of the Lord, not just any angel, an archangel of the Lord, one of the, one of the main ones who are like second in command. He shows up and he says to him, Zachariah, guess what? You're going to be a dad. And you would think that his response would be, I know the story. I know this is possible. I know that God can do anything he wants to do. But his response was this. <laughs> yeah, right. Good luck with that one which didn't make the messenger too happy. And so he's, he, he basically said, you're not going to be able to speak until that day that your child arrives. Now, if you're a guy, just imagine that for a second. Find out your wife's pregnant. Nine months, you can't say a word. She says, I need you to go out, honey, and get a jar of pickles or hot sauce or whatever because something inside of me says we need it. And all you can do is nod your head, yes. You can't argue it. You can't say it's too late. You can't say anything. And so it compounds it even more. And as he's going through this experience of not being able to speak because, well, this angel wasn't happy with them, God is actually trying to use that experience 
to symbolize something. And that is the inability to speak words until the time is right. And God, I think, was saying, I can't say anything until the time is right. And when I do, there will be a lot to say. And if you just back up for a minute and you ponder for a second those moments when you felt like, where were you, God? What were you up to? How come in my pain and my suffering, you didn't seem to be there? How long, O oh Lord, the psalmist says, how come, God, when I cried out to you, I just had the sense that I'm so alone? God according to that 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, it wasn't that he wasn't there. It's just that he didn't make an appearance because something needed to happen. The people had to be ready to receive what was coming. And my guess is when you suffer, you do one of two things. You either say, God, if you're not going to pay attention, if you're not going to help me out, I'm going to push you away. Or you say, God, I'm just going to keep focusing on you until I get an answer. And it's God's way of using the circumstances that are oftentimes painful to clarify our thinking and to prioritize what is most important. A lot of times people don't come to church or gravitate back to church or start going to church because God has kind of let things simmer a little bit. He's kind of let you struggle a little bit. He's kind of let you call out a little bit. And it's not that God is saying, I don't love you and I don't want things to happen in your life that, that, that you're hoping for. But rather, there's a time when it's best for me to act. When you are ready, I'll show up. And I got to think these guys were more than ready. If you look at this couple, they not only had the humiliation of not having a child in a culture that really said, well, what's wrong with you, Elizabeth? If you can't have a child, there must be something wrong with you. And she had that shame and humiliation day in and day out. And when Zechariah would go to the temple, it wasn't like the glory days when David was ruling, but rather on his way, he would see somebody with the equivalent of an AK-47 who was a foreigner by his definition and was a hostile person who would look at him with hateful and mean eyes. And that intimidating spectacle was something he had to face every day. And when he thought about that on a larger scale, at least they had a king. But the problem was the king that they had wasn't a king like David. It was more like a king that said, this is a wonderful gravy train. There are a lot of benefits to being king. I can have a palace over here, and I can have a summer residence over there, and I can have a lot of money from the 90% of the people that are doing all the work around here, and I can just live the dream. And that was King Herod, a king who was called to the responsibility of keeping people centered in their way of life, and yet he just saw it as a means to an end. And so there's no hope there. And then you couple that with the fact that the most powerful nation in the world is also keeping its foot on our necks and has for quite a long time. And there's no hope there. The temple that we worship at has no God and the glory of God present, so there's no hope there. And there is just a sense of hoping against hope. Now one day... Everything will be as it should. You ever have that sense? You hope that one day everything will be as it should? You ever wake up and you find that bad things keep happening to good people and seemingly bad people have good things happen to them undeservedly? You ever get a, a ticket in the mail from some entity for speeding somewhere when you weren't even there? You ever have 
injustice happen and painful things happen, pretty much all of us every day, and we wonder, God, are you there? And Zachariah had very good reason to say, I don't even have a child. So that sense of despair that pressed in on him was pretty powerful. But at least if that happened now, guess what? I could have a television in every room. I could have my phone. I could have some distraction that at least would keep my mind off of what's going on out there. But by design, believe it or not, God has called us to be a people not looking for distraction from the things that are going on in your head, but rather a people that are grounded in a story that says there is a reason to be hopeful. And I got to think, despite everything, Zechariah had to make a choice. I'm either going to be hopeful, and I'm going to think about the story and the hope that is embedded in that story, or I'm just going to give over to despair. And I think God honored that hope. It took a long time, but when he did, I'm pretty confident he said it was worth it. And when the time came, we read in scripture that God said, your son has arrived, then his mouth opened and things started to change. It was on. And if you want to look in your Bibles with me to um, uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 58 and following, I'm going to read this, and it really captures the drama, that sense of not having God anywhere and haven't seen that prospect for generations to that moment where God does show up. And this is what happens in Luke chapter, chapter 1. We read these words. <clears throat> he said, now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son, which is exciting enough in and of itself. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. Like, she's going to have a son and she's way past child, child rearing years and they rejoiced with her because they knew her pain. And the eighth day came and the child was circum circumcised and... It seems like, according to tradition, his name should have been Zechariah, like his father. But his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by that name. I'll just pause there for a second. Because, you know, we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We got probably people in here, maybe one or two named John. There's a person named John just about everywhere that you go. It's a pretty common name. But consider for a minute why they said, what? Huh? John? Well, from their point of view, John was, was, a, was a name that essentially meant this. Yahweh has given favor. Yahweh has given favor. Yahweh is the Hebrew God. He's the God of the Old Testament. And he's the one who left. And now it seems that all of the favor that left with him is coming back. And we're going to name him, well, it would be like naming your son Captain Marvel. It just doesn't fit. It's like, how, how does this even work? And then the thought occurs to them, oh, guess what? It is on. That thing in our story that says that day is going to come when the king's going to arrive, God's up to something here. Yahweh is showing favor, John. And they got pretty excited about that. Matter of fact, as they're pondering this, they're just thinking their whole world has gone from black and white to technicolor. It's this sense of we've got the king, we've got the Romans, we've got the, 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 the people that are beating up our people just for fun. We've got hopelessness in the womb and now it is all changing. And if you can capture that sense of excitement that people had, then you kind of can begin to comprehend why this start part of the story is so important. And so on the eighth day, they circumcised this child and um, they called him John. Let's keep going. And they made signs to his father inqu inquiring what he wanted him to be called because by rights in that culture, the father is the one who would be the ultimate um, designator of a name of a child. And maybe it was like, well, you know, I'm officially the guy, but she's the one who really calls the shots. But 
But I think it was a little different than that. I think as we read the story, this is significant. He asked for a writing tablet because, well, as you know, nine months I haven't been able to talk. And he said, his name is Yeho Jehovah or Yahweh has given favor. And then they all wondered, wow, this is significant. This is epic. And we read on that response. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke. Blessing God and fear came on all the neighbors and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. <laughs> all of a sudden, this is big news. And it was big news because, well, there's some symbolism here that we don't oftentimes pay attention to. But in their culture, they could pay attention to a lot of things at once because that's all they had. And the fact that his mouth was closed for nine months was basically symbolic of God saying, my mouth has been closed for 400 years. And the moment that he was able to write, Yahweh has given favor, it essentially represented the opening of the mouth of God for his people once again. And that's why they're so excited. And then they said, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And as they're doing the math, Zechariah, who has had a lot of words stored up for nine months, can you imagine nine months of not being able to say anything? What would be the first thing out of your mouth? Well, I bet it would sound like it was full of marshmallows because you hadn't talked for a while and you wouldn't be good at it. So once you kind of got that worked out, I got to think you'd have a lot to say and you'd probably be recounting back month by month things that you needed to weigh in on. Well, this is what he had stored up. So let's go ahead and look at the next slide. In, a, in, in, in the telling of this, it says, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is something else that didn't happen. It's just another way of saying God on a personal level is inhabiting the life of this person like he inhabited the temple on a corporate level. And so he's showing them right there in this small event that is getting ready to happen and it's going to expand to an epic scale, a scale that they really even at that point couldn't comprehend. And so he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people. And as he's saying that, he has in the background this idea of all the oppressors and all the heavy-handed people and all the abuse and all the trauma year after year that his people had to face and the humiliation. And if they weren't, because if you know anybody that's gone through serious trauma, the one thing that people will tell you is it, it begins to fracture or work on your identity. You're not real stable. And if you're not rooted in a larger story, it's even worse. Because then you have nothing really to stabilize you from the outside. But in the case of these people, the one thing that kept them going through all the stuff that they had to go through that was so painful, and all the traumas of the memories of loved ones that were abused and killed and mistreated and on and on, it was their story. It was their identity and who they were as the people of God. Well, let's go on. And he's raised up a horn of salvation, which is a dramatic way of saying that uh, God is the victor for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be safe from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. And going on. To show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. Very highly religious language, isn't it? But they've been thinking a lot about it. It's sort of like we've been reading the story, we've been listening, we've been hoping, we've been pondering, we've been processing, we've been doing all these things. And it's become vocabulary that's defined how we filter the reality around us. Because we're hurting so, so bad. And we're depending on God so, so much. 
That's all they had. That's the only way they could keep their sanity in an insane situation. They just had the word of God to stay anchored in. And now it's starting to pay off. Well, let's go on. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, and you will go before the Lord prepares ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because that's why we're here. We've chosen to turn our back on you, Lord. And you've said, I'm a gentleman. I'm not going to force my will on you. If you want to go your way, go your way. And they did. And they regretted it. They missed the mark repeatedly. And their lives were filled with the chaos and the drama that accompanied it. But because of his tender mercy, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of shalom. It's not just peace. It is that what being thriving that happens when our lives are not only rooted and centered in the story of God, but when our lives are rooted and centered in the family of God. And that's really where I want to go with this. Now let me just ask you a question. What is your routine like at your house when you know that somebody is getting ready to come over and visit? Does it go something like this? There's a person in your house who says these words. And it's not me. Our house is a wreck. It's filthy. It needs to get cleaned up. Why is that? Because in the mind of the domestic chief, the house needs to be in order so that hospitality can occur and our guests will have a favorable impression. Everything needs to be picked up. It needs to be swept. It needs to be vacuumed. Bathrooms need to be cleaned. Toilets need to be scrubbed. And you know the list. Maybe that's happened in your family. Perhaps it's happened in mine. And there was a day when that decree would be made and I could just outsource that to three kids and say, you heard your mama, get busy. Well, for whatever reason, they got tired of it and two of them have already left me. And now it's just me and the other one. And when he knows he's got an instinct for this, oh, we got company coming over. Oh, you know what? I got to go do this thing. So who's left? Myself and the domestic engineer. So in that conversation, there is a sense of tension because things are not as they need to be. And if our guests come and our place is a wreck, our house is filthy, God forbid the toilets aren't cleaned, well, it's just not going to be suitable. It's going to be embarrassed. The shame will probably go on for generations. It will be something that will be a mark on the more name forever. At least that seems to be the weight of gravity that's attached to it. And because even though I can speak, I only say two words. Yes, dear. And then off we go. Well, maybe that's you, maybe it isn't. But essentially, in effect, the people that had this sense that we are going to have a visitor come were thinking, are we ready? Are we ready? And God was also thinking that too. Matter of fact, that's the whole reason for the story because there needs to be one who will prepare the way, who will take the roads that are crooked and straighten them out, who will take the valleys and lift them up to level places and the mountains down. And that's just language for saying that you are getting yourself in order for the day that God's going to arrive on your doorstep. Now, a lot of us in this room have this sense that my house will never quite be in that order. I got stuff going on in my life that 
I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I come to church that people aren't going to judge me because I just don't have it together quite as much. I don't know if I'm ready. And I would like to assure you that you're not. That I'm not. That we are never ready. That the preparation that we do to bring the presence of God into our midst is something that we are unequivocally disqualified for. Now, I got to share this. When we clean our house and people come over and we're gathered and I look up in the corner and I see a cobweb, I'm like, oh dang, I hope somebody doesn't see that because that's going to change everything. And then you become aware of something else over there and you're like, oh man, we weren't as ready as I thought we would be. Well, the truth of the matter is, you're never ready. Your house can never be perfect. It can never be clean enough for the guests to arrive. And that's why this is a two-parter. There not only is one who says, get your head in that space where you are ready to begin to relate to what's happening. Start to think about the things of God Start to get connected to him by going to church, reading, reading your Bible, talking to other believers, and just get a space where you're starting to ponder those things that are, that are God things. It doesn't mean that you have to say, okay, I've got to quit, I, I gotta, I, I've got to quit chewing tobacco, or I've got to quit vaping, I've got, to, I've got some, some, some bad habits i got. No, 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 no. Just start engaging with the things of God. Get yourself ready. And as you engage with the things of God, all of a sudden things start to become more oriented toward them. And maybe you've already been doing that because your pain has so, been so acute that you've had this sense that I've been reading the word, I've been calling out to God, I've been preparing myself, and God says, yeah, now you're ready. Because I got your attention. And I didn't want to prolong this any more than we needed to. But we had to wait so that you'd be ready to receive. Now, I don't understand that about God. All I know, it's a two-parter. He waits. He lets the processes work to the place where he steps in. And then when he steps in, that's where his grace begins to overflow. And that's the wonderful thing about this is... There was a sense in Zachariah's life that we've messed up and we got to pull it together. And then when Jesus showed up, he said, I'm going to start with the people who don't have it together. I'm going to start with that gal who, well, she's lived with a lot of people and she feels a lot of shame. I'll start with her. And I'll just show up. And then I'll let her know how much I love her. And then I'll go to that guy that's been pushed to the side for so long because he's crippled. And I will show up at his doorstep. And I'll tell him, not only are you healed, but you're saved. And then I'll go to that person over there who has been suffering in silence for so long. And I'll give them the good news as well. That in that place of brokenness that's the place where I show up the best that's the place where I can really begin to redeem and heal and connect and I think for a lot of us it's been easy to be distracted by multiple television sets be distracted by our phones and the internet it's been easy to be distracted by anything except that thing that has to do with my soul. But then you find, I can't do that anymore. And I'm certainly not in a good place to invite God in. Because I've been kicking the can down the road for so long. I don't know if I'll ever be ready. And that's where God says, that's perfect. Would you invite me in? And our response is, my house is not ready. I 
have a lot of cobwebs and a lot of dirt on the floor and embarrassed to say, toilets aren't clean. You know what God says? We have an answer for that. And it's called a bloodstained cross that covers everything and makes the possibility of God with us very real. And so God is preparing the way like he did back then into your life and into mine, into our church, into our world. And the goal is ultimately, if we believe the story, which I do and that's why I'm here, is that he's going to merge your world and my world and his world together. And all this broken will be made right. But in the meantime, in this broken world, he's calling us into a family that says, if you are lost, you're confused, your identity is all over the map, this is the place to begin to heal, to pull it together, to become whole. And then when you are, this is a place to share that with as many people as you can. Would you bow with me? Father, as we just conclude this part of our message and our time in Advent as we're going through this journey, Lord, you know the hearts of each of us. You know how ill-prepared we are. You know, Father, our struggles. You know our despair. You know our darkness. You know the hopes that we hide in our hearts where we hope against hope. And you know that whole range of emotions that we bring into a place like this. And yet, Father, we thank you that a bloodstained cross takes all of those things and redeems each and every one of them. That you bring us into a new space as we begin to in inhabit a dwelling that you fill and that as we do, Father, you show your presence in our lives. You bear wonderful fruit through our lives. And you give us a grace that carries us each and every day. Father, I pray for everyone here that that connection through your grace and through that cross will be made possible. And despite everything that's happening around us, we'll be securely rooted in our identity and we will know our joy that we have and our hope that we have in you and you alone. Thank you, Father, for saving us and redeeming us. And for those who aren't, thank you for your persistent presence in their lives as we seek to come alongside them and lead them into your family. Help us to do that together, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.